So brothers and sisters in Christ, God bless you. Uh, as you see, we have new carpet. The pews are being refinished. Uh, those of you who are here on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday during the week got to see the, the in-process aspect of that and how uh, discombobulated the parish space was. And this is as good as we could get it to you. Uh, it's a miracle that we got this far with it, so uh, I am grateful to God. Uh, but it was a wonderful and providential experience that it should fall during the course of the feast of the entrance of the Mother of God, which you see here in the icon. The, the story which comes to us from the Proto-Evangelion of James, an apocryphal work outside of the New Testament, but considered by the early church to provide historically accurate details about the life of the Virgin Mary. There are many books that were written in the first couple centuries after Christ that purport to talk about Christ or the Apostles or the Virgin Mary and so forth. Not all of them are considered to be uh, accurate or true to the apostolic tradition. Proto-Evangelium James is one of those examples that is considered to be reputable. And so this feast comes out of that material, which is describing that when the Virgin Mary was quite young, she was brought into the temple. There was a community of young virgins and children and so forth. You hear at the end of every service, Joachim and Anna, that's not in the New Testament, but it is in the Proto-Evangelium of James, describing who they were and why, as they were parents of a child at a very late age in life, uh, they eventually dedicated her at the temple and with the other kids, kind of like a, a, a form, I guess the closest equivalent you could say was kind of like a boarding school, preparatory school of sorts for the, for the people of Jerusalem, a place where the girls can be brought up in a, in a place of holiness and to learn their faith and their culture. And the Virgin Mary was matriculated through that. And that's why at a very young age when she came into her beginning of her adulthood, shall we say, uh, they needed to find for her a suitable husband. And that's why Joseph uh, betrothed her. And, and that's how that whole story goes. In any case, it's a, it was an interesting experience to have that feast fall at a time when the, when the church was being stripped bare. Because it was as if we were going right back to basics. And in fact, on the feast itself, the altar was completely empty. The altar area had, was stripped bare. There was no carpet on the floor. And we had to bring the, the altar table and place it right here. And so on Thursday or Friday morning, we actually had liturgy on the altar table right here in the middle of the church. So it was kind of a little bit different for people who have never seen such a thing. But um, still, at that point, basically the entire church became the altar. And, uh, and that's actually completely appropriate for this feast, because that's what this feast is really all about. At the time that the Virgin Mary came to the temple, the temple was divided, uh, as it was according to the law, into several sections. There was the outer courtyards and so forth, and that's where Jesus, you know, drove about the money changers and things like that. Then there was the actual beginning of the inner area with the sanctuary where the priests would offer the incense and the various sacrifices beyond the first veil. But beyond the second veil, and we have a veil, we have a curtain to symbolize that, was the Holy of Holies. And in the Holy of Holies, no one went, except for once a year on the Day of Atonement, right? The high priest would go with blood for the forgiveness of the sins of the entire people. And part of, the, part of the legend surrounding the Virgin Mary is that she, as a child, actually went into the Holy of Holies and was nourished by the angels. That's pretty outrageous to think that that could possibly have happened. But I, but I actually would assure you that there is no more appropriate symbolism that you could find. Because what did the Virgin Mary do but be completely make obsolete that entire temple structure? Now, when the temple was first built, actually when the tabernacle was commanded, and only later the temple was built as a, a permanent version of the tabernacle commanded by God, the tabernacle was the place where God came and met his people. Quite literally, he, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and upon the Ark of the Covenant were the two cherubim, which formed the mercy seat. It's called the seat because God would sit there. And if you read in the Old Testament, they, one of the names of God was the God who speaks from between the cherubim. So the Shekinah of God, the presence of God, the face of God, if you will, would make itself known to the people of, to the people through 
that mercy seat, sitting in the Holy of Holies, and would converse with them when it was first made. And, it, and the Bible says that the glory of the Lord filled that temple, and the priests could not even minister to it. So it was very real and very powerful epiphany of God. But over time, that initial holiness was lost. Over time, not only did people like the Philistines come and steal the ark and all that kind of thing, but also the people of God themselves progressively lost their connection and corrupted themselves and their worship and their belief until eventually some of the kings did great evils and abominations. And uh, we're coming up on Hanukkah soon. Hanukkah is the feast of the rededication of the temple because at that point things had gotten so bad that Antiochus Epiphanes, the pagan uh, Hellenistic conqueror, came in and defiled the temple and sacrificed to Zeus on the altar in the Holy of Holies. By then the Ark of the Covenant wasn't even there anymore. Everything was in a very bad condition, in a very bad shape. And so the Maccabees, Judas Maccabeus, the hammer, as he was nicknamed, came in, drove them out, and they rededicated the temple, and that's what the Feast of Hanukkah is about. And that happened only a couple centuries before Christ. But by that time, there was no more anything special about the temple other than its historical significance. The Shekinah of God was long fled. The Ark of the Covenant was no longer there. The holiness was just not what it was. And as much as like the great, so-called great, Herod the Great, uh, established and, and, and expanded the temple and made it this incredibly luxurious place, it was spiritually empty. It was spiritually barren. There was no grace being imparted to that place any longer. And so when the Virgin Mary comes to the temple of God to say, oh, to say that she went to, went to the temple, it's a scandalous idea. It's actually the restoration of the temple itself. But now, in Christ, now in Christ, we no longer have to go only to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices for our sins, only and only once a year. Rather, now, the temple of God is wherever Christ is in his flesh. Because the Virgin Mary becomes the tabernacle. She becomes the tabernacle that holds within her the Ark of the... She is the Ark of the Covenant, who holds within her the tablets of the law made flesh. Christ, the living Word of God. She is the rod that budded forth of Aaron. She is the, 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 uh, the container, the, the jars of manna. Because what did Christ say about himself? He said, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, but now they're dead. But I came, and I'm the bread of life, and he who eats of me will never die. So the Virgin Mary fulfills all the symbolism of the Old Testament and restores to the temple in her entrance all that was missing at that time. But now, through Christ, that temple has been multiplied and expanded well beyond anything Herod the Great could ever even have imagined. Christ himself said to the uh, Fotini, the woman at the well, what? Soon the time will come where neither in Jerusalem nor here will the people be worshiping God, but wherever they worship, they will worship in spirit and truth. That is to say, the idea that God is only located in one place, in one time, for one people, was coming to an end. And that's what we hear in Ephesians today. Christ broke down that enmity between the chosen people of God and all the nations outside of them. No longer is salvation only of the Jews, but through the Jews, salvation came and now is offered to all, all of mankind. And so we celebrate this wonderful feast, which is the prelude of the salvation of mankind. The beginning hints of what is about to come. And so on, on, on Friday, we had the liturgy out here. We were kicked out of the altar. But it was a good reminder to remember that the altar is now not just a place. It is rather the fulfillment of the entire purpose of the Torah in every living human being who worships God in spirit and in truth, with faith, with love, with the fear of God. So now, not just in Jerusalem, but in every city of the world, in every country, in every century, the tabernacle is made manifest to the people of God, which is you. You are now the tabernacle and the temple. And this building, four walls and a roof, 
is the place where the tabernacle comes to reside for a while. So the body of Christ can recognize itself in each other and in the worship that we give to God. It's in this place that we bring the word of God. So brothers and sisters, the reverse then is also true. When you leave this place, you don't leave church behind. Your church is wherever you are. <coughs> wherever you go, you take the temple with you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So let us really start living that way. Let us come conduct ourselves in a, in, a, in a way that is worthy to our heavenly calling. The Ark of the Covenant was so holy that when they were carrying it and trying to do good, it st they started to stumble like we were stumbling with our carrying the pews out of here. And Uzziah reached up and touched the Ark of the Covenant to steady it, thinking he was doing good by God. But for his impudence, he was struck dead. How dare he touch something so holy? But the Ark of the Covenant, as holy as that was, is only a symbol of the holiness which God calls for you. And if we defile or degrade or insult the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is our own bodies and our own souls, what, what result will happen to that? The death that we suffer will not be the death of Zion, but an eternal death. That's the great danger. So let us take very seriously the calling of holiness, perfection, and righteousness that God has given to us. It's not something we just say and give lip service to if we really want to say we are children of God. So brothers and sisters, God bless you through the prayers of the Holy Theotokos, who's now your mother, my mother, and the mother of all Christians. God bless.